God is a God who hides himself, according to Isaiah 45, 15. And one of the most intriguing ways that God hides himself is in symbolism. Certain things in the Old Testament contain metaphorical prophetic messages that are fulfilled in the New Testament era. God loves to do that. And one of the major areas of symbolic foreshadowing is the Temple of Solomon. We covered a lot of territory last week. We're going to dig into it even deeper on this episode. So let's talk about the mysterious symbolism of the Temple of Solomon. God's new covenant people are referred to corporately as a temple of God, and they are referred to individually as a temple of God. And so the symbolism is both corporate and individual. Remember that. And many facets of the Old Testament temple are revelatory of something God is doing in each one of us personally, including the seven primary pieces of furniture that were in the temple of old. And that's our main area of focus today, the furniture that was in the temple. But first of all, let me remind you that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, God said, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That verse makes it very clear that you're going to be a shrine to one thing or the other. You're either going to be a temple of God or a temple of idolatry. You're going to exalt worldly things to a position of idolatrous worship in your life, or you're going to put the living God, the God of creation, on the throne of your heart and enshrine him with your life. There's no real middle ground. It's one or the other. The temple of God in the Old Testament was considered to be the holiest place on earth, but it pales in comparison to the living temple of the New Testament era because we have been made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ washing us clean. And the Bible says the new man, that internal man inside of each one of us, is created in righteousness and true holiness. If we're going to dig into the symbolism of the temple, I've got to go all the way back to the one who had the vision for it to begin with. David, of old, wanted to build the temple, but because he was a man of blood, God disallowed it. And it was transferred as a responsibility to Solomon, his son, whose name means peace or rest. I believe all of that is highly symbolic because Jesus, our Savior, who was a man of blood on the cross, envisioned the temple of the new covenant era, but he left. He departed from this world and sent the Holy Spirit, the spirit of peace, the spirit of rest, into this world to actually do the construction work. Just like David laid up all the materials necessary, the gold, the silver, the brass, the wood, the stone, he laid up all the materials that were necessary, and Solomon implemented the process. In like manner, with his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus obtained the materials necessary to build the temple of the New Testament era. Now, we can't go into the revelation of the temple without first talking about the pillars that appeared on either side of the temple entrance. Those pillars are very important because they are symbolic of two pillar-like attitudes that should flank the heart of every person who claims to be a temple of the living God. Those pillars had names. One was called Jachin, J-A-C-H-I-N. The other was called Boaz, B-O-A-Z. Jachin means God will establish, and Boaz means in him is strength. I believe two pillar-like attitudes should flank my heart if I claim to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. 
no matter what I face in life, no matter what you face in life, no matter how much pressure comes against us, we should lift our hands like the two pillars that were on either side of the door to the temple and say, God will establish his purposes in my life. God will establish me in his plan and in him I find strength. Though the flesh may be weak in Christ, I am strong. And if you have those two pillar-like attitudes, you will shine in this world because according to history, those pillars were fire altars, 35 foot high fire altars. And they could be seen from a far distance when pilgrims were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. They could see the fire on the top of the pillars from afar off, and they knew they were getting closer to Jerusalem, closer to the temple, and closer to the God who was dwelling in the temple. In like manner, there should be a fire altar burning on the top of our lives, crowning our lives that can be seen afar off so that people know when they get in our proximity, they're getting nearer to the God who dwells within us. Now, let's go into the temple itself. In the last episode, I talked about the first piece of furniture encountered, which was the altar of sacrifice, a huge altar. But something I did not mention was this fact that on that altar, three fires were kept burning. There was a fire that was specifically to light the incense on the altar of incense, which represents prayer. We'll get to that in a little while. There was a fire that was used specifically for the sacrificial animals and offerings that were offered up to God. And there was a fire that was used for nothing except to replenish the other two fires. And I believe that represents three kinds of fire that should be burning on the altar of our hearts the fire of sacrifice, passion to present our bodies a living sacrifice, the fire of prayer, because incense represents prayer, passionate prayer, not just going through the motions, and the fire of vision, because that fire that was used for nothing else except to replenish the other fires was a visionary fire because they had that fire there because they maintained a vision of keeping something consistently going in the temple as God instructed, where there would be no break. There would be no time when the menorah lampstands were not shining. There would be no morning where there was not burning incense in the temple. And you and I have got to have a vision for consistency, being continual in our commitment to God. If you continue in my word, Jesus said, then are you my disciples indeed. So the first thing encountered in the temple area was the sacrifice, the sacrifice that was offered up to reconcile an individual to God, the sacrifices that were offered up to reconcile Israel as a whole to God. It was all about reconciliation. And once we are reconciled, we become God's means of reconciling others. In fact, Paul talked about it in his letter to the Corinthians when he said we have the word of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. God didn't send me into all the world to tell people how bad they are and how terrible they are and how much they are doomed in their future uh, although certainly that's a part of the scenario ahead of many people, God sent me with good news. That's what the gospel is. It's good news that all of this is avoidable and that you can be forgiven. You can be restored. You can be reconciled, which means to be restored to a right relationship with God. There's a beautiful scripture in Psalm 118 verse 27 this says, God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. I liken the cords that held down the animal sacrifices to the cords of love that hold us in a sacrificial position. 
I don't believe nails held Jesus to the cross. I believe he was bound by his love for the Father, the vertical beam, his love for the human race, the horizontal beam, and his love commitment in those two directions created a cross, a death to self that was necessary to become the price to redeem humanity. You and I are best motivated by the same thing, not because of a sense of obligation or responsibility or fear of consequences if we fail our calling and our purpose. Listen, there's something much higher in motivational strength than any of those attitudes, and that's real, sincere, authentic love for God and love for others. That will bind you to the altar. And I like the word bind because that's what covenant is all about. A covenant is a binding agreement between two or more parties, each binding himself to fulfill certain obligations. And just like the sacrificial animals were bound to the altar, you and I are bound to God in a covenant relationship. He's bound to us. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. We should respond by being bound to him, saying, to the best of my ability, Lord, if you'll help me and grace me, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Let's go to the next piece of furniture in the outer court. See, there's three chambers. There's the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. And I covered that somewhat in the last episode, that that represents the three parts of us. We are triune beings in the ma manner, in the pattern, in the image of the triune God. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet one God. We are spirit, soul, and body, yet one person. And the spirit connects with the Holy of Holies. The soul connects with the holy place. And the outer court is representative of the flesh. The flesh is something that needs to be dealt with on a daily basis, just like the sacrifices were there on a daily basis. And not only were the sacrifices continually being offered up to God, you and I have to renew our commitment every single day to stay safe, to stay secure in our relationship with God. Also, there were two other pieces of furniture in the outer court besides the altar. And listen, the word altar, by the way, has a double meaning. It means a place of elevation, and it also means a place of sacrifice. And in the kingdom of God, these two are one, because only by sacrificing yourself can you be elevated in the things of God. Only by humbling yourself can you be exalted. That's the way it works. But the next piece of furniture encountered in the outer court is uh, in the temple area, not the tabernacle of Moses. It was enhanced quite a bit in the temple, was something called the Molten Sea. And the Molten Sea was a huge brass container holding 15,000 gallons of water. Can you imagine? It was for the cleansing of the priests. And that molten sea rested upon 12 oxen, brass oxen. And each one, uh, or rather, uh, there were three groups, four groups of three, rather. And each of those groups was pointed a different direction, north, south, east, and west. And all of that is highly symbolic. And then around the the molten sea were 10 lavers. Each of those were filled with about 300 gallons of water, and they were for the cleansing of the sacrifice. All the sacrifices that were offered on the altar had to be cleansed at the lavers because only that which is clean can be offered to God, and that would preach in itself. Well, let's visit that in a little bit more detail. So the water represents something. If it is the means of cleansing for the priests and for the sacrifices, what does it represent? Two things are, are symbolized by water in Scripture. 
the word and the spirit. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, it says we are cleansed by the washing of water by the word. And then in John chapter 7, verse 38, it says that if any man thirsts, Jesus cried out and said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And out of his inner being will flow rivers of living water. So in other words, he's saying something will flow into you, but then it will awaken within you the resource of the same thing, and it will begin flowing out of you. Think of that. So this he spoke concerning the spirit, the Bible explains, which was not yet given for Jesus was not yet glorified. Very important point, because the Holy Spirit did not dwell in people until the New Covenant era. The Holy Spirit moved on individuals, but they were not a permanent dwelling place until the blood of Jesus was shed. So the water represents the word. The water represents the spirit. Interesting, because there's two elements in water, hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. And there's two spiritual elements in living water. And that's, I call, word to spirit. Two parts word, Old Testament and New Testament, and one part spirit fused together. And just like the molecule is created with two atoms, the hydrogen and oxygen fusing together, and it becomes liquid, a mystery. So also when the spirit and the word fuse together, it satisfies the thirst of the human race and provides a means of cleansing us. The Spirit of God washes us. The Word of God washes us so that we can be committed on a consistent level as sacrifices to God. All sacrifices had to be washed and so that we can function in a priesthood role. All the priests had to continually wash themselves to stay clean in order to properly fulfill their office. So we've covered for the most part, what was in the outer court. The one thing I do want to mention, though, is the 12 oxen. Again, four groups of three oxen pointed north, south, east, and west. To me, represents the burden, because the oxen are burden-bearing animals, the burden of bearing the water of the word and the water of the spirit to the nations. And, of course, that was done initially by the 12 apostles and all the disciples that they influenced and that Jesus left behind when he ascended into heaven. They went into all the world in order to preach this wonderful good news of what Jesus came to accomplish. Next, let's go into the holy place. And there's a lot more details we could cover, a lot more details, but I want you to see some of the most important symbolic parts of the Temple of Solomon. When you go in the holy place, there were 10 menorah lampstands, and there were 10 tables of showbread, and there was one altar of incense. Now, all of that is an increase, because God is a God of increase. And the tabernacle of Moses, which was God's original dwelling place in the wilderness journey, only had one menorah lampstand, one table of showbread. But in this Temple of Solomon, it's magnified. And 10 is the number of divine order. You find that number uh, several times. And we're going to see how significant it is in symbolism in just a moment. So there's 10 golden tables of showbread. What is showbread? It was fresh bread. It was bread that was cooked every week and placed on the altar, 12 loaves on each altar, 10 tables of showbread, each one with 12 loaves, 10 times 12 is 120. And we know that there were 120 in the upper room when they voted on the person who should take Judas's place as one of the 12 apostles. And probably there were 120 when the Holy Spirit came. We don't know that for sure. We do know there were about 120 when that voting took place. But still, the 120 number is very much associated with the birth of the church and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And 
those that were God's original group of disciples that brought salvation, the salvation message of the New Testament to the world. So I think it's significant. Of course, it represented the 12 tribes of Israel during that era, but on a higher level, it also represented something God would do in the new covenant era. What about the whole idea of bread and what was that bread called? It had a number of names in the Old Testament. The show bread was called the bread of God. It was called the bread of face because it was laid before the face of God. It was called the bread of presence because it was laid in the presence of God. Because if you'll remember, the fire that was on the menorah lampstand in the holy place was taken from the altar, and that fire fell from heaven to begin with. That was God fire. That was not ordinary fire. So that bread was constantly being bathed in the light that emanated from the fire of God. Can you imagine? And it's symbolic of what we should be experiencing on a daily basis. So it was called the bread of presence, the bread of God, the bread of face, and it was also called the continual bread because there was never a time when that bread was not there. And there should never be a time when we are not presented on an altar as bread to nourish God's heart for fellowship with his people. And it's a dual symbol, really, because if we fulfill the calling to be bread, not only will we be bread to God to nourish his heart, we will be bread to a human race that is starving for the truth. Just like Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You and I have taken on that image. And you can find that in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. It says, for we being many are one bread, for we are all partakers of that one bread. In other words, spiritually speaking, you are what you eat. Now, that's something that people say a lot with regard to your diet and its effect on your body, but it's true spiritually also, that if you eat the bread of life, you become an extension of the bread of life to others. We being many are one bread, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Now let's go to the menorah lampstands. Ten of them, golden lampstands, and they were made from one piece of gold. Each one of them was made from a large piece of gold. Think of that. And there were four parts to each lampstand. You have the container, the oil that was placed in it, the wick, and the fire. And then, of course, the light. So really, it's, it's uh, more than that. It's uh, five parts. The container, the oil, the wick, the fire, and the light. The church is referred to as a lampstand. Individual churches in the beginning of the book of Revelation are referred to symbolically as golden lampstands, menorah lampstands. Each individual believer is represented as a lamp. The scripture says the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. And so God uses our spirits if we have a will to serve him. That will is like the wick that is ignited with the fire of his indwelling, and we shine light into this world. So all of this is true on an individual basis, and it's true in a corporate sense for the entire church. So what does the menorah lamp stand represent? Remember, all the furniture in the holy place is gold, and gold is a symbol of the divine nature. The outer court, everything is brass, and brass is a symbol of judgment. Judgment against sin, judgment against Satan, judgment against the curse, all the things that kept us from God. God dealt with that in the outer court. But when you get in the holy place, it's gold. We're moving into the image of God, the nature of God, the character of God, the gold of the divine nature. Beautiful, beautiful symbolism. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But he also said to you and I, if we're believers, you are the light of the world. Now, what about the veil? And what about the colors of the veil? Well, the veil was made up of blue and scarlet and purple and fine linen. And all of those are symbolic. 
because the blue represents that which is heavenly, the scarlet that which is sacrificial, the purple that which is royal, and the fine linen being white is the fine linen of the righteousness of the saints, imparted righteousness that is given to us and the righteousness we attain within ourselves through our works, married together into one. That veil led into the Holy of Holies, but there was one piece of furniture that you encountered before you went into the Holy of Holies, and that was the altar of incense, the golden altar of incense, where incense was offered up daily. Psalm 141, verses 1 and 2, listen to what Paul's, or listen to what David said, not Paul. He said, Lord, I cry out to you, Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. See, David knew something. He knew that prayer doesn't get very far unless it's set on fire with passion for God and set on fire with the very presence of God because only that that comes from God to start with returns to him. And he sends the fire of spirituality and supernatural reality in our lives so that we can burn back toward him with true passion. And we should be like David saying, Lord, I don't want this to be occasional. Once a week, I pray for 10 minutes. Every single day, Lord, let my prayer be set before you like incense. Because by the way, Incense does not really emit its odor until it is set on fire. And then that smell, that aroma fills whatever room it's in. Think of that. You want the aroma of prayer saturating the atmosphere of your life so that no matter where you go and what you do, prayer has bathed it and divine appointments are happening at unexpected times. And that's what happens for those who really walk in the reality of being a temple of God. Now, all the ingredients in the incense are highly symbolic. It would take an entire program just to focus on that. Maybe I'll do that sometime. But notice how the closer you get to God, the holier everything gets. Now, the temple was called the Holy Temple, but within the Holy Temple was the Holy Place. And the holy place was one where the menorah, lampstand, the tables of showbread, the, the altar of incense was located, where all of these were located. The 10 menorah lampstands, the 10 tables of showbread, and the altar of incense. And all three of those combined were symbolic of what enable us and empower us and ready us to take the next step beyond this veil, through a veil that is blue and scarlet and purple and fine linen. We've got to pass through that veil to get into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is and where the glory of God rests upon that Ark. So you've got to become heavenly minded. That's the blue. Sacrificial and giving your life for others. That's the scarlet. You've got to recognize yourself as God's royal seed, children of the kingdom. He's the king of kings. You are his royal offspring. That's passing through the purple. And you've got to have a righteous mindset, a commitment to live righteously in this world. That's the fine linen. Next is the holy of holies. So it gets holier the closer you get to God. And in the next episode, I'm going to focus just on the Ark of the Covenant and show you how, if you are the temple of God, now the Ark of the Covenant abides within you. That's going to be a very interesting set of symbols. You don't want to miss it. And by the way, I would urge you to go to my website and get this book. This is almost out of print. It's volume six of our Glorious Inheritance and in this book, there's a chapter on being the temple of God and a chapter on being the place of his rest. It's a book with about 187 names and titles given to the people of God. 
And in the chapter on being the temple of God, I cover a lot more territory than I have on this episode. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to the next time.